We welcome all of our new online listeners. Hi, my name is Dr. Stephen Finney, the hosting pastor of XL Church in IOM America. My wife Jane and I are blessed that you decided to join us. XL represents Exchange Life. Our church is an outreach of IOM America. Everything we do sits upon the pedestal of compassion. So let's get started. Enjoy the worship, illustrative videos, prayer, and weekly message. I just wanna be where you are Dwelling daily in your presence I don't wanna worship from afar Draw me near to where you are I just wanna be where you are In your dwelling place In your dwelling place Take me to the place where you are Cause I just want to be with you I want to be where you are Dwelling in your presence Feasting at your table And surrounded by your glory In your presence that's where I always want to be I just want to be I just want to be with you I just want to be where you are Dwelling daily in your presence Dwelling daily in your presence I don't want to worship from a Draw me near to where you are Oh my God You are my 
Jesus Christ, I come before you as a representative of the body of Christ. Father, as you know, one of the most important issues as a fellow believer is to understand your holy temple. Lord God, I'm so thankful that you commanded Moses to build the Ark of the Covenant, which literally housed the presence of your very being. Then many years later, you instructed Solomon to build your earthly holy temple. Hopefully each one of us are thankful that you stepped up and began to provide what is important to you in regard to the believer's worship and ultimately literally becoming a part of this holy temple by anointing us and appointing us as pillars to this temple. Then through Jesus Christ, you made it real to us that we became the temple of the Holy Spirit. So this grants us very special relationships as body members in Christ Jesus. And it also grants us a very special privilege to know that you picked bridal members for your son. And through the work that your son did on the cross for us, you made us temples. Honestly, Lord, I can't think of anything that is more exciting than that. Father, your temple is under attack today worldwide. People have lost honor and respect in regard to the important points, the 12 important phases of your holy temple. My discovery, Lord, is that many of your indwelt believers, Christians, bridal members of your son, are completely ignorant to the holy temple. I personally believe, Lord, that all of life is centered around your holy temple. 
As I study the book of Revelation, I am amazed, Lord, on how many times you reference the temple and how the temple literally is a mirrored image of the throne that you sit upon. So I pray for all believers that they truly take the time to understand your holy temple, all the little details that you specifically worked at making and implementing symbols that communicate your identity and your character. We love you and we thank you for giving us these details in the Word of God. And again, Lord, I just plead with you that you would open the minds of true authentic believers that they would come to know the details of your holy temple. Because personally, Lord, I think it will help them understand the book of Revelation that you wrote through your son's beloved friend, John. As usual, we only pray in the power and authority in Jesus' name. Nothing is more important than his name. So much is done through his name and through the authority that you have given him. So we pray in the power and authority in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to welcome you to our weekly online church service. For those of you who have been tracking with us, we've been going through a series on the book of Revelation. We call it the 220 Revelation series. It's been quite a journey, and we have been unfolding some of the most powerful pieces of prophecy that God has fulfilled in the book of Revelation. For those of you who are new to our series, we truly do want to welcome you. We encourage you to take notes. Also, there is a PDF of the slides that you'll be seeing in this presentation in the description box of this video. Again, welcome, and let's get started. This is number 26 of our Revelation series. We began to talk about Israel being sealed by the living God and it will reveal the holy temple of the living God. There are many people today that simply do not understand the importance of the holy temple. Most reference it as a temple from the Old Testament. This simply is not true. Today we're going to be dividing up the holy temple into the three phases that have been brought to us by the living God, in Jesus Christ himself. That is why our subtitle for this particular message is The Holy Temple, Then, Now, in the Book of Revelation. So the keynote to understand and remember at this particular point in time is that the temple of the Old Testament was to set up for Jesus fulfilling all of the 12 separate categories that are within the Holy Temple. And finally, Jesus was to set up for the temple spoken of in the book of Revelation, which can easily be classified as the throne of the living God. All of the little pieces that we discover in heaven through the book of Revelation, we discover a very significant fact, that the temple was set up on earth by the living God as a mirrored image of what is taking place in heaven at this present time, and what is about to take place in the future. So let's take a moment and review the eternal most holy temple. This is found out of Exodus 25 verses 10 through 22. It says, They shall construct an ark of Acadia wood, two and a half cubics long, and one and a half cubics wide and one and a half cubics high. It also says you shall overlay it with pure gold, 
Inside and out you shall overlay it, and you shall make a gold molding around it. You shall cast four gold rings for it, and fasten them on its four feet. And two rings shall be on one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of Arcadia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings in the side of the ark to carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. You shall put it into the ark, the testimony which I shall give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubics long and one and a half cubics wide. You shall make two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherub of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherub shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherub are to be turned toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark and in the ark. You shall put the testimony which I will give you. There I will meet you and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherub, which are upon the ark of the testimony. I will speak to you above all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. May God bless his word. As a part of our Revelation 2.20 series, I believe it is important to insert the wonderful truths contained within the study of the meaning and purpose of the Lord's holy temple. Then, now, and of course within the book of Revelation. Organically, the holy temple in the Bible was built in 960 BC by King Solomon. But its history dates back to the days of Moses. Exodus 25 reveals God was giving Moses directions to build the Ark of the Covenant. Now let's talk about the Holy Temple and how it started with the Ark. The key component here to remember is that the Ark of the Covenant is the place where the Lord met and talked with Moses. Contrary to most, it did not start with the law, but rather relationship. In Moses' day, God referenced this dwelling place as the most holy place of the tabernacle. The obvious reason being that this was the place God connected with his people. The description tabernacle means a temporary dwelling place. Until God secured the land to host the earthly capital of his people, Jerusalem, the tabernacle was used as a mobile structure to position himself with his people as they were on the move. The tabernacle was ordered by God to house the ark, his presence. The ark was the first item built and then the directives came to build the tabernacle, which was a tent, according to Exodus 25, verses 10 through 22. It was through the immovable guidelines of the dimensions and placement of the ark that ignited the beginnings of the law. So first relationship and then the elements of protecting the relationship, the law. It was through this demonstration that the Hebrew people view to this present day the law as protective. All this resulted in the people viewing God as a loving God. The reason the most holy place was separated from the holy place is simple. God knew that it was necessary to keep himself separate from the tabernacle leaders, priests, and even their people. God mandated curtains, a door, made of olive wood to keep him separate from man's sin. The reference of the olive wood becomes a prophetic symbol and parallel until the last day of earth. Many theologians believe that the tree of life was, or is, an olive tree, concluding the tree of life is the barrier between God and sinful man. It is the exact reason God ordered Adam and Eve out of the garden before they were tempted to touch it. 
Furthermore, he mandated that the priests must remain separate from the worshipers. Finally, the walls of the tent were implemented by God to separate holiness from the defiled earth. The reason why people and priests had to remove their sandals before coming into the tabernacle. The Levites, sons of Jacob, predestined to serve the sanctuary. They were appointed by God to be set apart to carry the ark, stand before him, intimately serve him, and reflect the honor of his name. Only certain people were allowed to speak the name of God publicly. There was only one who could enter the holy of holy places, and that was the high priest, the Old Testament symbol of Jesus. The role came with restrictions. The appointed high priest could only enter into the most holy place once a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement. After entering, the high priest was to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, the top of the ark. It was in this act that atoned the people's sins before the living God. In the New Testament, Jesus became this sacrificial blood that was sprinkled before the holy of holy places in the temple, resulting in the ripping of the veil. The ark was topped with two cherubim, angels, God's dwelling place was systematically centered between the two, according to 2 Samuel 6, verse 2. Once King Solomon built the holy temple, God upgraded the twelve elements of the tabernacle. Before we itemize these elements, know this. The temple's purpose was to orchestrate the rules of engagement. He implored the people to know that he, as God, made the world and established the rules of intimate, relational interaction between the people and himself. Remember, God told Adam that the result of sin was death, disobedience, sin-filled life, and diseases, all separating him from the holy of holies. Despite this, God loved his people and had eternal mercy for each. Special note here, before Jesus' death and resurrection, God provided a way to atone for the sin so that the people could be in the holy presence of the living God. Thus, enter his temple. God allowed the blood of the perfect animal to temporarily take the place of the sinner's life until the ultimate blood sacrifice could be made, the shedding of the blood of his son, the Lamb of God. These actions confirm the Lord's commitment to providing a way to remove barriers, the veil, that were erected in the garden. Here are the eternal parallels between the Old Testament, New Testament temple, the then and now. At the same time, I want you to carefully monitor the details that transition into the book of Revelation. The very first thing when you walk into the gates of the holy temple of the living God, you will see the brazen altar. The altar made of bronze, and bronze actually means man's metal or man. The bronze altar, thus in the Hebrew communicates, make a person part of the body. So back then, God required the people to sacrifice a perfect animal for their sins regularly. The blood of the animal justified the people before God and restored their relationship with him, making them a part of his body. That's found in Leviticus 17.11. The now, the time of Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross, Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. He led a sinless life and willingly died for the sins to make us righteous and a part of his body, the body of Christ. That's found in Hebrews 9.25. Finally, when we look into the book of Revelation, bronze altar converts itself to the golden altar. God actually equals gold, pure gold. Another little note to keep in mind here is gold is the most substantial metal on and in the earth. It never ages and it keeps its shape, it keeps its purity as long as it exists. The next thing that we're going to see is the need for a pure sacrifice. The act of surrendering a possession or offering is what sacrifice means. 
Back in the Old Testament, the person bringing the offering put his hand on the head of the animal while it was being killed, symbolically putting his sins onto the animal. The animal died in his place. That is according to John 1.29. Now Jesus is the Lamb of God, just as bulls and lambs were sacrificed in the Old Testament. Today we are required to present our bodies as a living sacrifice acceptable to God, holy, not conformed to the world, but with a renewed mind. It is in this act that we are to offer God another kind of sacrifice. That's the sacrifice of praise to his name, doing good and sharing with others. John 1.29 confirms this. And then looking into the book of Revelation, we have the final sacrifice sits at the right hand of God, Hebrews 10.5. Now let's look at the sea basin. The basin is made of bronze. It means cleansing the body. Back in the Old Testament, the sea basin ultimately represented the crystal sea surrounding the throne of God. Priests washed at the basin, purifying themselves before entering the holy temple. It was the Old Testament symbolism of water baptism. Scripture that goes with that is Exodus 30, verse 18, chapter 38, verse 8. The now, in the time of Jesus, believers in Christ are saved and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. After this cleansing, baptism of the Holy Spirit, Indwell Christians were mandated to experience water baptism. This water baptism is associated with this sea basin. For those who were obedient to this mandate, the privilege of passing through the crystal sea on heaven's side was granted. Jesus' symbol of this is that he walked on water, which is also saying that he was upon the sea basin. He did not need any washing. 1 John 1, verses 7 through 10 confirms this. Looking into the book of Revelation, sea of glass mixed with fire, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. Need to make the obvious connection here. When Jesus was walking on water, it was a direct connection to the sea basin. And in Book of Revelation, when we as believers are standing on the sea of glass, we too have been given the supernatural ability to rise above the sea basin. Now let's talk about the brass pillars. Pillars are made from bronze, and they mean in the Hebrew, Boaz on the left and Jacob on the right. Then, back in the Old Testament, the pillars called Boaz means quickness. And as I just said, they were on the left. And Jachin means he will establish. And as stated, that pillar is on the right. Both pillars support the portico covering of God's holy temple. Each of us need to be quick to establish his authority in personhood. Now, in Jesus' time, Jesus became the doorway, pillars, to enter into the presence of the living God. He firmly established the quickest way to reconnect with the Heavenly Father and His domain. Looking through and into the book of Revelation, the authentic bridal members of Christ become the pillars of His final temple. And here's the verse to verify that. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God in my new name. That's in Revelation 3.12. Now let's look at the holy place, the next phase through the temple walk. The holy place was the service place of the priests of God. In the Hebrew, they're called chief ministers. Then, only priests were allowed to enter the holy place, and they did this daily. Now, with Jesus, authentic believers in Christ, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, were granted permission to enter the holy place. The sacrifice has already been paid in full. 
And then on heaven's side, through the book of Revelation, all believers are given the privilege to dwell in the holy place of the final temple. Each bridal member is ordained by God through Christ to be the final priest and nation of the living God. This declaration anoints the believers as chief ministers on the new earth. Revelation 26. Taking a couple more steps through the temple, we come to the golden lampstands and tables of showbread. The lampstands are the seven churches of the first generation church. Showbread equals bread, fruit, loaves, and the final meal offered to God's people, oftentimes referenced as the wedding feast. Back then in the Old Testament, the bread of presence of God represented the twelve loaves of bread that stood for the twelve tribes of Israel and are presented and shown in the temple of Jerusalem as the presence of God in each of those tribes. The loaves were a symbolic acknowledgement that God was the resource for Israel's life and nourishment and also served as Israel's act of thanksgiving to God. That's found in 1 Kings 7.49. Now when we look at Jesus, Jesus transformed the Old Testament representation of showbread to himself. He literally became the bread of life. Now the 12 loaves of bread symbolize the 12 disciples. Key numeric code reveals all numbers in the Old Testament had to be converted into the New Testament. Jesus was making clear he was the bread of life, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and his disciples were the loaves of life, and the final meal became the Last Supper. The loaves, the twelve disciples, became the resource for Christ's life and nourishment to the seven churches. Then when we look into the book of Revelation, since Jesus became the bread of life and the seven churches became the light of the bread, which means lampstands. The lampstands surrounding the throne of God communicates the seven churches and close the most holy place of God's final temple. Eternally speaking, the seven churches became the final nourishment to the living God. And how cool is that? As for the 12 tribes, God selects 12,000 from each tribe to become the 144,000 saved in the Great Tribulation. That's in Revelation 3. Moving on to the golden incense altar, gold is the metal symbolizing God. Incense is the eternal symbol of prayers and the altar is the place of sacrifice. Looking then into the Old Testament, the only way the Old Testament people could present their prayers, prayers offered at the golden altar of incense became a special sweet incense required by the law to open interaction between God and his people. Now Jesus fulfilled the law to grant believers direct access to the throne of God without forced ritualistic prayers. It opened the door for born-again believers to pray from their hearts, not a book. Now the believers and their prayers become a sweet aroma to the God of the universe and beyond. Read 1 Timothy 2.8. Now in Revelation, on heaven's side, the prayers of the believers are the contents within the seven bowls. Each of these prayers became a sweet aroma unto the Father, which was before the throne. In Revelation, it tells us, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Now let's take a look at that veil, that thick veil that is separating the priests from the most holy of holy places. The veil was a curtain suspended between the holy place and the most holy place. Pectoral Hebrew reveals this veil was made of woven olive wood, the creational elements of the tree of life. Also, it was a substance that separated the woman from an authority figure or owner. This birthed the ideology of women wearing veils. 
Then back in the Old Testament, due to the sin that Eve, woman, committed in the garden, God placed a veil between her and the presence of God, resulting in God separating his holiness from sinful people. Only the high priest was privileged to intrude on this barrier once a year. To remind the people of this adaption, God enacted a sundry law for women to wear a veil when awake. Note that God has always referenced the people of Israel as she. Read up on that in 2 Chronicles 3.14. In the now, because of Jesus, he fulfilled the law and became the high priest. The new she became the bride of Christ, the church who, by the way, became grafted into the pure bloodline of the Israelites. He removed the veil upon his last breath on the cross. Immediately, the holy veil was torn in two from top to bottom in that temple. This granted access to all authentic born-again believers to have direct access to the Father through Christ Jesus as the high priest. Hebrews 10 verses 19 through 22. Then looking into Revelation on heaven's side, the Bride of Christ consummates with her groom, Jesus, once all the saints have been gathered into the final temple. Note, this privilege is only available to those who has made herself ready, who has adorned herself for the groom, and thus selected as the Bride of the Lamb. At this time, the veil is lifted and the groom kisses his bride. Look up those passages right there in Revelation. You'll find them quite rewarding. Most holy place, the most holy place equals the dwelling place of the living God. It was protected by immediate death to those who intruded upon this room. God himself enacted immediate death. So in the Old Testament, the most holy place was God's throne room on earth while he would meet and give his commands, which was between the two cherub, angels, on the mercy seat over the Ark of the Covenant. The high priest would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat on the annual Day of Atonement to atone for the sins of the people who resisted God's authority and laws throughout the year. In the now, Jesus became the anointed blood of the final lamb sprinkled upon his Father's mercy seat, granting mercy to all indwelled believers reborn into the body of Christ. Jesus' actions opened the door, the veil, for all authentic bridal members to access God the Father personally. Hebrews 14:16. In Revelation, on heaven's side, the most holy place is the throne of the living God. Believers will continually shout out, give praise to our God. Bridal members will be granted the privilege to stand before the living God, watching God open the books one at a time. Each will hear with their own ears these great words, Behold, I am making all things new and that includes the temple. Moving on to the cherub, the Hebrew defines cherub as the high order of angelic beings. These beings are not ordinary angels. Each is granted eternal powers to protect the mercy seat in which God dwells. Both are given the power to end life upon any and all intruders. Old Testament then, these sculptures, cherubim, winged Creatures represented the guardians of God's divine presence. They were made of olive tree wood, tree of life, overlaid with gold, metal of God, and their wings touched each other, wingtip to wingtip. As God clarified to Moses, he banished man from the Garden of Eden. He placed cherub in a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. The tree of life is the ultimate symbol of God's presence. In like-mindedness, the chair above the Ark of the Covenant is mandated to protect the mercy seat of God. Hebrew scriptures note many deaths to those who touched the Ark. 
Now in Jesus' time in the New Testament, the cherub lifted their wings and rose from the ark to reveal the glory of God's representative of the ark. That's none other than Jesus Christ. But as for the cherub, writer Paul notes this, but of these things we cannot speak in detail. The these things were referencing the details of the cherub, for they were too holy and powerful to reveal. Looking into the book of Revelation, on heaven's side the prayers of the believers are the contents of and within the seven bowls. Each of these prayers became a sweet aroma unto the Father which was before the throne. Our scripture says, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Revelations 5.8 Finally, looking at the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark box was made of Arcadia wood, a wood recognized by its fruit, robust structure, and resistance to external influences. The box was lined with pure gold inside and out. The combination between the Arcadia wood and gold makes this box a container resulting from fruit, making it strong, resistant to external elements, that are maintained by the longest lasting metal, gold. Then back in the Old Testament, the construction and instruction for building the ark came with details of perfection. The type of wood, metal, and dimensions as disclosed in Exodus chapter 25 verses 10 through 22. Within the box contained the first 10 foremost laws of God, the 10 commandments inscribed on two tablets of stone. Its lid, the mercy seat, represented the meeting place between God and man. Now with Jesus, after he was resurrected, he not only became the blood sprinkled upon the mercy seat, he became the box, resulting fruit, container, and representative of God. The New Testament immovable structure and demonstrated the resilience to all external elements. All of this resulted in God making a way to commune with born-again believers. Now the bridal members are in the box with Christ, his Father, via the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 9.4 Revelation, the temple of God which is heaven, conducted its open house once the saints have been gathered. At this time, the Ark of His Covenant appeared to His people, at which time ignited flashes of lightning and sounds of pearls of thunder, resulting in the great earthquake. Revelation 11:19. Our final place, the resting place, is the storerooms. The storerooms in connection with the temple are not modish, modern, these storerooms contain the treasures of God's holy temple. Scripture refers to these items as temple treasures. All of its contents were made of pure gold or minimally plated with pure gold. The value of each was beyond measurement. Then, the Old Testament, the storerooms were mandated by God to house every consecrated thing he instructed his people to make. Think about that. Thus each item had a symbolic connection to the identity of God. King Solomon made a mistake of adding his personal treasures to the mix, resulting in defiling the temple treasures, which enacted rebels to plunder these treasures several times throughout biblical history. Read more about that in 1 Chronicles 28 verses 11 and 12. Now with Jesus, after his father released him in ministry, he commanded a new mandate, not to lay up treasures for ourselves on earth, but to lay up treasures in heaven. These treasures came by way of good deeds, which created an eternal weight of glory. Look up those verses. Looking into Revelation, after our Lord gathered all of his bridal members, the eternal weight heavenly treasures of glory are presented to the believers. Therefore he states this, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to
to render to every man according to what he has done. Revelation 11:19. Now we can take a look at the connection between bridal members becoming the temple. As you look at this diagram, it starts out as sinful man. Sinful man was not able to get into and in through this narrow gate without a sacrifice. And that's why the first phase there associated with the bronze altar is repentance. The second phase is the pure sacrifice, and of course that was done through Jesus Christ, which granted us forgiveness. The sea cleansing phase is that we were cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And as we move to the brass pillars, this is the evidence that we truly have become indwelt by the Holy Spirit because in the book of Revelations it states we become the pillars in the new temple. The holy place was a place for the priest and if you remember from our scriptures you'll discover we become the priest on heaven's side. The lampstands of course have always symbolized us being the church, the showbread being the bread of life, and body members in Christ Jesus become the light of the bread. Then when we enter into incense altar phase, that's when our prayers are made significant. Then when we look at the holy veil phase, that veil was torn from top to bottom. So the veil has been removed so that the true indwell believer can have direct relationship with the living God. The most holy place is like us walking around every single day in total complete freedom and intimacy with Christ Jesus. The cherubim are still active in protecting the bridal members of Jesus Christ, so you can count on that. The Ark of the Covenant is the symbol in the new temple as being in Christ, which places us in the Ark of the Covenant. And finally, the storehouse is the symbol of the believer receiving their rewards. In the end, it's all about reuniting his people with himself, Every story deliberated in the Bible is and has been directing all of humanity to this single cause. Many along the way defiled the tabernacle and the holy temple, but not one has been able to defile the final holy temple housed in the new Jerusalem. No spirit or human has been able to defile this particular temple. Many people, Christian or not, are vague minimally ignorant of the purpose and construction of the New Jerusalem. If there's any takeaway from this snapshot of the temple, it should be this. The New Jerusalem is the final holy temple of the living God. While Satan builds an earthly temple to conduct his end times modalities, Jesus Christ will conduct his final judgment and rule through the New Jerusalem. And remember, this is 1,000 human years. The new Jerusalem will come down from the sky, heaven, and finish the ordinances of the temple of God. After that, he will take the new Jerusalem, the heavenly host, along with his bride, and locate itself in its final resting place, the new earth. Up and coming message, we're going to dig into the details of the seal of Israel. Revelation 7, 4 tells us, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. Thank you for joining us today. It really was an exciting topic, at least for me. We hope that you stay with us as we unfold more of what God is speaking of in the book of Revelation. Until next time.